year is 1986. Over here in the UK, the beloved game show catchphrase with Roy Walker inserts itself into the Saturday night TV lineup. UK and France announced plans to construct a channel tunnel. Manchester United appoint their most successful manager of all time, Alex Ferguson. Then Watts gives Angie her divorce papers. That's probably a local reference for any Stenders fans out there. This little legend is born. Yes, this is me. Yes, I was cute. No, I don't know what happened. And also in 1986, this movie was released to audiences. So to coincide with his 35 year anniversary and a limited re-release in cinemas over in the US, firstly, hopefully you're gonna give this video a like. And then secondly, we're gonna revisit the film that scarred an entire generation, which is now known affectionately online as the Great Toy Massacre of 86. So the basics on the inception of Transformers is this. The entire concept of Transformers is basically one big advertisement for toys. Most of the generation one toys for seasons one and two of the TV show were made years prior to Transformers ever debuting. In fact, they was from mostly two different existing series of Japanese toys, Diaclone and Micro Man. These were eventually imported and licensed by Hasbro in the West. Hasbro? Hasbro in the West, given names and backstories and then shoved it to a cartoon to promote. The toys that made us on Netflix has an episode on it and it goes into great detail about it. It's pretty interesting. So if you haven't seen it, do check it out. It goes well into the backstory, interviews with people in the know. So yeah, check it out. So fast forward two years and after two seasons of airing on TV and all the kids have bought all the toys, the toy lines need refreshing. The higher ups need something new for the kids to circle in the Argos catalogue. That also might be a English thing, a local reference and the kids need to get their parents to spend their hard-earned money on something new. So enter Transformers the movie. Right, so spoilers ahead, obviously, if you haven't seen this 35-year-old film, but everyone fucking gets it. So prepare yourself. So we open up on Big Bad Unicron. No pissing about, no mystery or who done it. This planet-sized monster done it, and for sure, he's gonna do it again. Now the narrator casually drops that it's the year 2005. So like I mentioned up top, I was only born the year this film dropped. So if like me, and you had to play catch up and say only watch this film almost a decade after its release, you are given absolutely no context that canonically 20 fucking years have passed in between the end of series two where they left off things and where this film begins. It literally took me to be a full grown adult to be able to make the connections that human in this movie Spike is the adult version of Spike in series one and two. And he now has his own kid, Daniel. At no point is this explicitly explained anywhere or outlined anywhere. So back to the story. So seeing as 20 years have passed, the Decepticons have all but taken over their home planet of Cybertron and the Autobots have set up bases on two moons around Cybertron as well as an Autobot city on Earth. And oblivious to the impending Unicron threat, the Decepticons have decided to make a big push against their enemies to put an end to the war once and for all and shit hits the fan from there. Seven minutes into the film, we've already slaughtered half the toy line. Braun, Prowl, Ratchet and Ironhide are all sent back to the scrap heap. Why are they attacking Megatron one by one? And nobody is rushing him all at once. The Decepticons caught up to the ship, boarded, transformed before any one of them even stood up. Then Megatron hits us with the first of many memorable quotes throughout this film. Such heroic nonsense. <laughs> Fantastic. Side note, the disrespect to the other Autobots just casually killed off screen, not even mentioned. Wheeljack, for example, just murdered off screen and glossed over as casual as you like. Mirage is never seen again. And that's without mentioning the Decepticons, Megatron, Thundercracker, Skywarp, Starscream and Bombshell all also kicked the bucket later on in this film. Then we hit Earth and everyone is new. Daniel, Hot Rod, Cup, RC, Springer, Blur, Ultra Magnus. No introductions, no explanations. It's been 20 years, you should have known that by now. And these guys are here, you just have to deal with it. This invasion culminates to a one-on-one -on -one showdown, Prime versus Megatron, a battle for the ages. In the smack talk, Megatron states, I'll crush you with my bare hands. And then proceeds to use the following weapons. His arm fusion cannon, a rock spike, a plasma sword, and a laser gun. And the result, 26 minutes and 15 seconds into the film, the moment that broke a million kids' hearts. Poor Optimus Prime is no more. Oh my god. Are you gonna cry? No. You're gonna cry. 
This scene had kids wailing out of the cinema only a third away through the film. All thanks to Hot Rod's interference. Fuck Hot Rod. Fuck him, you prick. Cup told you already, it's fucking Prime's fight. Absolute dickhead. Usa. Now, insert memorable moments of this film. 15 minutes in, memorable appearance from Blaster, calling out an SOS. I think he shows his face one more time and then he ends up on the back of Milk Carton or on Crime Watch or something. But that son of a bitch is missing the whole rest of this saga. 17 minutes and 10 seconds in, RC puts Hot Rod, dickhead, in his place. I was afraid you'd be trapped outside the city. Uh, hey, I wasn't worried for a microsecond. Then you probably didn't understand the situation. Then, roughly 30 seconds later, Springer, with his memorable quote of the film, I got better things to do tonight than die. And where the frick is Superior, Defensor, Bruticus? Such a massive assault like this, and none of the combiner teams are about except Devastator. I mean, personally, I know where they are, but this is not the point. This film was so long in production that these characters were introduced into the TV series after the film began production. So even though the film is set 20 years in the future and these characters canonically appear before and after this saga, they don't show up for this one mega saga. One of the most important conflicts in Transformer history. Just, just jarring. The epic defeat music when Megatron falls. Then little, little rumble carrying Megatron's fusion cannon. Astro Train insisting they shed weight to get to Cybertron even though there's no gravity in space. Plus, how fucking big is Astro Train for Devastator to be able to merge inside his cargo bay? Self-aware artificial, inte Self artificial intelligent robots with off-the-scale intellects that have mastered interplanetary flight can't say charismatic. Hey, nobody Soundwave, Sound the loyal deputy that he is, the good soldier, and carrying Megatron's battered body from the battlefield, then just standing by the cargo door, holding it open, while Starscream tosses him into the void of space. Wait, I still function. Wanna bet? 29 minutes and 24 seconds, a funny quip from Unicron. Summons you here for a purpose? Nobody summons Megatron. Then it pleases me to be the first. Then, almost instantly after, calling Megatron on his bullshit about crushing Prime with his bare hands. I have already crushed Optimus Prime with my bare hands. You exaggerate. So, two minutes in. Get our first line from Leonard Nimoy. I will rip open Ultra Magnus and every other Autobot until the Matrix has been destroyed. And how the frick does Starscream know that's Megatron? Granted, they both have arm cannons, but that's where the similarities end. Different body, different color scheme, different troops, different voice. 36 minutes in, the big S bomb from Spike that caused the film to be a PG rating. It isn't even dented. Oh shit, what are we gonna do now? Jump ahead and 56 minutes in, RC and Blur just absolutely fuck off and abandon Daniel. The poor kid has crash landed on a planet that he doesn't know due to a war that he isn't a part of. And a couple minutes prior to this incident, he couldn't even walk in his exo suit. And now they're just like, yeah, just transform, it's fine, it's fine, just transform. And just leave him in a combat situation to fend for himself. Dick move, even from RC. Dick move. Slag, I believe it in, is very uncharacteristically polite, regardless of the planet he's on. Excuse me. Plus, where is the other Dinobot? There's supposed to be five, right? But there's only ever four throughout this whole film. What is what is that about? And how toxic are the Junkions? They just watched Ultra Magnus and his team crash land so they can see that they're having a bad day then they watch as they're attacked by Galvatron then Ultra Magnus is killed by Galvatron and then after all this after all that trauma 
they then proceed to attack whomever is left over. Fucking scumbags. So the budget of the film was somewhere between five to six million dollars. That's without promotional budget. And whilst the animation is better than your average TV episode, and it does look more reminiscent of a Japanese anime slash manga, I would imagine that the majority of that budget went into the big name voice actors. But I don't understand who this is for. Peter Cullen and Frank Welker reprise their roles as Optimus and Megatron respectively, and that's great. But on top of this, you have Judd Nelson, hot off the Breakfast Club as Hot Rod slash Rodimus Prime, Eric Idle of Monty Python fame as Retgar, Orson Welles in his final film role as Unicron, and the also late great Leonard Nimoy as Galvatron. Now that is a great casting, but as a child, who gives a fuck? Who's literally looking at the cast list and thinking, as a seven year old, Ah, oh, the legendary Orson Welles is voicing a monster planet that I've never seen before and will probably never see again. I am so excited for that. He was amazing in Citizen Kane and Mercury Theatre on Air. No one. No one is thinking that as a seven year old. So who is this for? Why waste that budget? And on top of this, now full respect to Orson Welles and Legend of Nimue for, for different reasons. Orson Welles was in very poor health for the recording of this and in fact he died only five days after recording his scenes. But more power to him for sticking to his contracts and putting in his performance in such ill health. Welles told his biographer Barbara Lehman and I quote, You know what I did this morning? I played the voice of a toy. I play a planet, I menace someone called something or other, then I'm destroyed. My plan to destroy whoever it is is thwarted and I tear myself apart on screen. So he seemed like he was quite into the role. On the behind the scenes, the director Nelson Shin said that Orson Welles' health was so bad that he had to run his voice through a synthesizer multiple times just to get some usable dialogue. Apparently he was panting just trying to get the dialogue out. But I mean, it works. He does sound quite good, regardless of how synthesized it is. Now, let it Nimoy again, what a great casting choice. Already famed for Spock in Star Trek and literally had Star Trek films released either side of this movie. His dialogue for Galvatron is top draw. Apparently when arriving to the studio to record his lines, he asked where the bathroom was and then went off for half hour and could be heard doing vocal warm ups and scales for 30 minutes just to get ready. And honestly, it shows that gravelly, deep, menacing tone of Galvatron is one of the best voiceovers of the whole movie. No disrespect to Frank Welker's efforts, I love him as Megatron, but when he takes over as Galvatron in the third season, it's just not the same. Defo noticed the shift in tone as a kid. Now, you can't mention the budget without talking about the soundtrack. I am very biased when it comes to this, but in my opinion, one of the best soundtracks of any kid's film. Especially one that isn't a musical and people want bursting into song mid-scene. The main song that everyone remembers is The Touch by Stan Bush, which is synonymous with the Transformers movie. But this was actually written for and offered to Sylvester Stallone for his film Cobra, which obviously was ultimately turned down much to the benefit of this movie. Every major scene is just amped by the glam metal, glam rock, whatever you want to call it, soundtrack that accompanies it. And here's a montage. Songs from this soundtrack have been used in films and TV shows and games such as Brookie Knights, Chuck, Saints Row 4, American Dad, The Goldbergs, Glow, Young Rock, and I'm sure many, many more. So yeah, the film was made on a roughly budget of $6 million, minus promotional costs, and only raked in just under $6 million at the US box office. As far as I can tell, it wasn't even released at the UK box office. The film was also rated PG, due to Spike's potty mouth, which we mentioned earlier, which was then removed from home media so the film could be changed to a U. 
And honestly, the balls on the fucking studio execs and toy execs to kill off Optimus Prime, the heart and soul of the franchise. This also didn't help with box office draw because who is gonna go watch this film, go back to their friends and say, oh yeah, the film's really good. They killed off our favorite character. You should definitely go see that multiple times. No, no one wants to relive that trauma multiple times as a child. And then to add insult to injury, they put Hot Rod slash Rodimus Prime into this new leadership role. The guy whose fault it was for Optimus Prime's death in the first place, they put him as the new leader. Go, go, fuck it, stupid really fucking. Jibby. So many kids were haunted and scarred by this that they had to do a huge U turn and add dialogue to the end of the movie on re releases and home release that Optimus Prime would in fact return. Now, this is something that we may cover in a future video, but if you've made it this far on my rant of the Great Toy Massacre of 86, thank you for sticking with me. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe. Drop a comment in below if you want to share your traumas of the Great Toy Massacre of 86. We can start a support group. We can be in this together. Get at me. You can catch me on Twitter, Instagram, Patreon, all the majors at uh, Mr. Twisted Visions. Hopefully, I'll catch you in the next one.